Chomran Wirawarawit is founder of Mysterious Ordinary, a creative consultancy that specializes in creation, production, and consultation, working mainly with artists, filmmakers, designers, and architects. In 2018, she co-produced Ghost 2561, a video and performance art triennial in Bangkok founded by artists Korakrit and Akapol Sudasna. Nathalie Johnston is founder and director of Myanmar, a project space and resource center in Yangon that investigates contemporary Myanmar art and promotes artists to local and international audiences. She has written for numerous publications, including Art Asia Pacific, Art Stage Singapore, Myanmar Times, Mizima, and has produced and edited numerous exhibition catalogues. Silan Palay is a visual artist from Singapore whose practice focuses on the concerns and complex conditions found in a present-day globalized society. He is the mind behind Koda Culture, an independent artist-run space in Singapore. Mark Rappel, our um, moderator, is editor-in-chief of Art Review and Art Review Asia, the latter of which he founded in 2013. He has delivered talks and lectures from the London School of Economics to Art Basel Miami Beach and organizes an annual series of talks on art for chart in Copenhagen. Please give a warm applause to our speakers and moderator. Thank you. Um, I'd like to first of all thank SEA Focus for inviting us to have this platform here. Um, the talk is very much about um, introducing, how you introduce diverse artworks and art forms to as wide a range of audience as possible and the different ways you can do that often outside of the traditional structures of museums and institutions and um, commercial galleries. So I thought at the beginning it'd be really interesting if each of the speakers kind of located themselves because we cover a, a kind of range of geographic locations and the talk will in some ways I think be about shared concerns and interests and probably problems and also things that are really specific to each particular place. Um, and there's some images scrolling that will be scrolling through on the screen um, so you can kind of, so it won't be kind of like a fairy tale, but you'll have some reference to a reality. But Natalie, I wonder if you could start. Um, hello, everyone, and thanks again to uh, Sea Focus for having us here. I'm really among great company, so it's really nice to be able to share with you. Um, I'm going to show you a few slides of the space that I founded in 2016 in Yangon. Um, we, we are an exhibition space, a reading room, um, an archive, and a gallery. So it's, we're, we're trying to be many things, but there's a very specific reason that we opened this platform. Um, and, and that was to support young and emerging artists. The gallery scene in Yangon is very much commercial. It is quite conservative. There are state-run art schools, and there's not a lot of, uh, well, almost no funding. So most galleries are owned and run by artists themselves. Um, this is the space. It's in a, an old colonial building um, in a downtown uh, street. So we, we open to support education and to allow artists to make what it is that they want to make without having the pressure to sell. Um, and you wonder how we make money. Well, we don't, um, but we, we, we do support ourselves. We're able to sometimes sell the work, we're able to rent the space, um, and, um, and we're able to get the artists, uh, to support the artists as much as possible in production. But I believe that Yangon needed a free place, a free for artists uh, to, to practice what they want, when they want. Um, and, and now we've been open for two and a half years and quite successfully supporting the artist community. We've had um, innumerable events and exhibitions and we try to fit in as much as possible to, to support those artists. Uh, maybe can you show just a couple more images uh, just to give you an idea, traveling exhibition from Hong Kong um, and music event. And that's and that's Coda Culture. So maybe we can switch over to. Um, hi everyone. Uh, thanks to SEA Focus for having all of us here. Thanks, Mark, for inviting me to be on the panel. I should probably start by introducing myself as I founded Mysterious Ordinary um, kind of organically. My background is not in art, it's actually in law. I kind of did the full nine yards that you could do as a lawyer without actually qualifying and um, specializing in intellectual property. And what I always knew from 
that entire course was that I wanted to work with artists and I wanted to realize projects. Coming from Thailand, being back in Thailand, you know, in the years between all of my studies, I always felt that we could do more in the absence of kind of the infrastructure that existed. We, we could basically realize more projects. We could basically communicate what we have better within Thailand and kind of outside. You know, the frustration that I had came from this very fact that if I wanted to see a film by an independent Thai filmmaker or, you know, the fact that the first time I ever experienced a piece uh, you know, an, an artwork by a Thai contemporary artist. It was never in Thailand. So, you know, what I did was um, I started writing. I started a blog, as you do in the 2000s. And a friend actually said, you know, you're, you're going to these art events, these art fairs. Why don't you start writing about Thai artists? I said, yeah, I would love to. I just don't, don't know any. And she introduced me to Navin Rowan Chaikun. This was in 2008, and this is kind of where it started. I was working at the time for a very large state-owned media enterprise. And um, it was there that I realized, hmm, maybe there's an opportunity to, to promote or offer kind of, to, you, know, you know, not even promote, to be able to communicate what was happening in the ind independent kind of film scene and also a little bit of a, the contemporary art scene. And, it sort of started my relationship with Apishat Pong Wirase Takun, the filmmaker, the artist. And in 2019, when he won the Palme d'Or for Uncle Bunmi, I managed to convince the TV station to activate our partnership with CNN at the time to do an interview. And we were the only Thai TV station to have any of this, like as footage. So you can imagine, it was sort of the start of something. And I realized that for me, it wasn't necessarily a space that I wanted to create, but a sort of a space that's kind of invisible, but a dialogue to show that all of this existed. And it sort of organically became something more. And in um, 2010, we had this idea to do a film festival in the south of Thailand. And that was with Abhishat Pong and another curator. It was uh, Tilda Swinton. And what we did was we invited our friends to do things together. And the inspiration for that was we wanted people to see that Thailand, I mean, for me, you know, for me it was more, I wanted to see people that it wasn't just like going to the beach and drinking Singer beer, that we could actually be a point of reference or a point of origin for, for artworks to be created for people to meet and to collaborate on projects. So you might have seen a couple slides before that was a floating cinema that we built or that was designed by the architect Ole Sharon, who has a couple buildings here in Singapore. It was built by the fishermen on the island and um, you know, we showed films on there. I think there was another slide after that with a screen that was actually Rick Ritt with Arto Lindsay doing a performance in the jungle. Um, you might ask, like, how, how do you fund something like that? You know, and I mean, the answer really to that is like with great difficulty. Like, it's really difficult when there's not a public sector that supports you in any way. So, I mean, we were lucky that we had the tourism board support, Thai Airways, and you know, for me, it's always been trying to find that space in between where commercial brands can work together with artists in a way that both can win, you know what I mean? It's not like a lose-lose situation that we're going for. So after a film on the rocks, the roster of artists that came together, you know, who created things together, the dialogue continued. We eventually, I did a pop-up restaurant in New York with the chefs who cooked for us that time. So Bowen Dillon, so that was our, little floating cinema. It existed for one night and then all of the pots were kind of given back to the village. That's Rick Ritt and Otto there in the jungle. And then part of the program for Film on the Rocks was um, a series that we did with the students on the island with the Thai Film Foundation. And the, film, the, the screen just before was um, the films that these students had made on the island. And when we did this pop-up in New York, it was an opportunity to communicate that we had done this. And also to raise attention to some more projects that we were working on, and it was the first time that Korkrit Aruna Nunchai had, ho had hosted a dinner party, so to speak. So my space is, is, is a social, I'm God, I, that sounds funny, but my space there is kind of a social space, right? So these collaborations, these conversations that start when you have like a dinner party to celebrate something, when you feed people really great food and they go back with that memory. So um, a few years later, I recruit had, in, had kind of, we're having a conversation. He said, you know, you've been to the Land Foundation. Maybe there's something that we can do. So um, I hosted a fundraiser with some friends 
with Paddle 8 in Hong Kong at Art Basel to, to raise funds for the land. And that was really interesting because what we have is, you know, the, the land foundation, which is in Chiang Mai. It's, you know, land which is free and open for all to come and use and experiment. But, you know, we, it, it's harder to take people to Chiang Mai. So in a way, the audience, that idea of the audience, it's almost like finding a way to connect to them. And you can't disregard the fact that they don't exist. You can't, you know, think they don't exist. They might just not know. So this idea, that was the dinner that we did in Hong Kong. And then that's a shot of the Land Foundation. And then, um, yeah, last year I co-produced a video and performance art series founded by Kori Krit Arunanun Chai. It's to take place every three years in Bangkok. And, um, you know, that, that was difficult to fund, but it was a lot of in-kind. You know, what we found was people will sometimes, you know, sponsors will say, we can't support this, this is too niche. But what we found was the moment that it was open for all to access, it starts to kind of maybe shift things. And the space in between all of those activations that I do is kind of, I mean, I write. And the slide that you saw with like the fire thing, that was um, an Apishat Pong, an excerpt from a visual diary that he made for, for us. I was working with a magazine and um, it was that space that we would offer to artists as well. It's like a print media platform. So I guess that's kind of, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Great. Silan? Hi. My name is Silan Pali, and I'm a Singapore artist, and I run an independent space, an artist-run space called Coda Culture. And just to give you a bit of like context and background, um, kind of like the opposite from what was described in Myanmar, where there's a lack of state funding or no none. In Singapore, we have an excess of state funding, but the excess does not just mean funds. It also means an excess of intervention, an excess of, of um, interference, and an excess of over-dependence of artists on the state for funding. Now, to, to just give you a very uh, simple example, there's a painter who last year had a series of paintings ready in his studio and he refused to show them because he didn't get funding from the National Arts Council. Now, if you travel to any other country in the world, that would be absurd. But he applied three times and he didn't get the grant and he did, just didn't want to do the show. All right. So, um, this leads to this uh, excess of state funding and this over-dependence leads to both censorship and self-censorship. Censorship, censorship uh, in a very active uh, role by the state to interfere and change and stop works and even ban works and also self-censorship by training certain artists and art groups to change their methodologies. For example, if a theatre company puts on a, a play that is unfavourable to the state, the next time they apply for funding, they'll get less of it. So that's, it's like training dogs, you know, that's what they do. So in this kind of climate and atmosphere, uh, the role of Coda Culture is to allow a platform that is uh, entirely free and, and gives uh, full autonomy to artists and makes them self-sufficient. And we do this by not taking any state funding. And uh, we do have uh, sales, we do have private donations, but most of it is just artists getting together as a community and pooling their resources, sometimes even pooling the resources of their friends and families and putting together shows. Uh, using this methodology, last year we put on 12 shows, 12 exhibitions, uh, solos and group shows, and uh, we, we, we try to provide a platform that is free from censorship, but also free from economic pressures. We tell our artists not to feel pressured to sell, but to do the best work that they can and to express themselves freely. And what's more important than the show that they do at our space is what they do next. So it's all about artists first and creators first and putting, even to the point of putting their schedule before ours um, because uh, I don't consider myself a gallerist, uh, I don't consider myself a curator, I would just call myself a community organizer. And um, later on, uh, maybe I can elaborate on some of the shows that we've done and giving you some background to some of the circumstances that we've worked with. Uh, I was quite uh, thinking about the title of this uh, panel quite a bit, uh, fostering, the words fostering, the words diversity, and the words art ecosystem. Mm. And we have certain methodologies to address 
all of those uh, words. Maybe we can get on to it as we get into a discussion, take questions. Thank you. I mean, I think picking up from that, and I think one of the things that's really apparent from the three of you as you talked about what you do is that none of you could be categorized as any one thing. So researcher, gallerist, archivist, librarian, producer, organizer, fundraiser, um, communicator, and artist and curator. And I think maybe one of the interesting things is in some ways you're all creating an eco ecosystem in which you can survive rather than slotting in to something that already exists. And I wonder if that's something you were aware of when you first started on all your projects. Um, I think an, an, another thing we all have, oops, sorry. Another thing we all have in common is um, it's the spaces that we live in, the cities that we live in, that, uh, that kind of um, slotting in um, is, is maybe the least productive thing we could do. And given that there are, when you talk about there are particular positions, um, the curatorial position, the art historian, um, uh, they're not, it's not a very welcoming space. I mean, it's not very easy to slot into these places. So to create your own environment with the artists that you work with, with the artists that you support, um, and you listen to them as well. And what, what do they need? What, what do they want? They want a public platform. They don't want to have to pay to work. They would like to be paid or be supported. They'd like to be free to express themselves. I mean, I think our respective cities um, forced our hands in a way, in a good way. And Shaman, was that something, I mean, because you came into it sideways almost. Yeah, I mean, I, I find it's very difficult for me to explain to somebody what I do for a living um, because, you know, as, as you've described, Mark, it's a little bit of everything, but, you know, depending on the circumstance, depending on the specific project, my role changes, and it's really identifying, you know, what it is that we want to create and how I've been doing that. It's quite, I guess, people-centric. You, you, you kind of have an idea in common. You have something that you want to communicate, and you kind of recognize that in that, ex that specific space at that time, that's the thing that's missing, and that's how you come together. And um, it's, yeah, it's like a kind of shifting sort of thing. Uh, my circumstances are almost personal because uh, I myself have never taken any state funding throughout all the 12 to 14 years that I've worked in Singapore. And uh, I've also been uh, banned and censored many times for my works. Uh, there was a performance art event uh, many years ago a group performance art event where the organizer was basically told that uh, the show will not happen if Ceylon Palais' name is on the bill. So uh, going through all this as, a, as someone who just left art school uh, and, and just for my views and just for the way that I wanted to express my art, I was going through, uh, somehow I managed to survive and keep practicing. And I wanted to create a space also in inspired by other local spaces like Your Mother Gallery, Post Museum, and P10 before that, um, and o spaces within the region, uh, I felt like there should, be, there should be another freer and autonomous space for artists to say whatever they want. And, uh, and d despite all that, I never show in my own space. My whole priority is to show other artists, uh, and especially young artists, uh, who face a lot of challenges and a lot of uh, advice as they are beginning their careers. What kind of advice do you give them? Or you don't give them any advice? <laughs> I don't give them any advice. The only advice is put on the best show you want, say whatever you want, and um, if you're lucky, you sell one, all right? <laughs> I think one of the other interesting things is that in most of what you all do, there's a sort of, there's a degree of fixity in terms of spaces, but there's also a degree of flexibility. So, Silan, you've just moved spaces again. Chomwan, you don't even work with the space yeah. exactly. Yeah and you work on multiple projects at the same time, how do you, do you need to build in a flexibility so you don't essentially become part of the stereotype or the culture you're reacting against? I can kind of illuminate on my situation is that sometimes I felt like a space would be the answer to all of my, you know, kind of this, this thinking process. This, I could do more with a space. And what I've come to realize is the space that I feel most comfortable in, which has kind of been the driving force for the actual things that happen, the activations, is that, that in between, it's where we communicate. And that idea of 
communicating, being able to speak to an audience, to be able to share that something exists, you know, in Thailand is, is not that straightforward. And, um, you know, say there's a lot of material, but maybe in, in much the same way as Singapore, it's not information that's necessarily free and good and for everyone. Well, they say it's for everyone. So it's creating those alternative spaces where we can be able to communicate what it is, you know, that we want to share, where artists can come together. And that's why, you know, that space that I'm talking about is, is, is I guess, media space, really. It's where communications comes in and that's, yeah, that's, that's that space. And I guess for all of you as well, how much, I mean, following on from that, how much of what you do is really about the audiences? as much as it is about the artists or the artworks, about, I don't want to say educating, but making things available and open and accessible. I mean, is that, in a way, one of the prime focuses of what you all do? Uh, I think, um, I mean, our, our, we're still like artist-centric, you know, the artists are always at the center of our concerns and our work, um, but uh, we've, at least we've been talking and we notice like audiences, they form organically, they grow on it organically, and sometimes uh, we have more people, much more people at our openings than a commercial space. And, um, and to me, it's, uh, it's not just the works inside the space or the conversations about the work, but all the conversations among the audience, outside the space, around the space, even when they go to have a meal together, all of this is kind of like a community building and it's very organic. And many uh, projects and collaborations come out of these, so I think that's been interesting. Like, we've never wanted to educate or foster an ecosystem, but it happens. Yeah. Yeah. Um, for us, it's a little bit different. Our audience was the art community. Um, so we are in, we're not an artist-run space, but we are an artist-led space. Um, so the, the, the people who come to our openings are people that live in Yangon, um, and most of them are artists supporting each other, you know, showing support, showing up. But part of what I've realized, also being a foreigner living in Yangon, my role has to be educating outsiders about Myanmar and what, and what it is. And I've met so many people in the last 10 years of working in Myanmar who don't even know where it is. So it's like a very basic starting from scratch. This is what the community is like. These people are working super hard on these particular topics. And this is how the political situation is affecting them as well. So we, we do have an education aspect where we, we are educating new audiences who may be, and maybe in a way um, forming new audiences as Myanmar has been an isolated ecosystem for so many decades. Um, on that, on the audience thing, just going back to what Mark said, how I sort of maybe came in from the side with what I do, I always, not coming from the art world or not having been to art school, I always felt that, you know, there could be more people who could care if they just had access to it. The audience, which we've defined to be the audience for art, might be far larger if they kind of knew what was going on or if, you know, you let them take a foot into the door. And, you know, when I moved back to Thailand the first time around, it was really hard to kind of, like, be taken seriously at all because I didn't come from that, you know. So it took a little bit of time, but when you know, pe people start realizing that actually it, the ecosystem is more than just this. This is like the world that you live in and it's about food and it's about kind of coming together. It's about fashion and all of those things and they can exist together. There's just, you just gotta define that space in the middle. So that, that, that you know, I'm very hopeful and we've, we've noticed in Bangkok that that audience, people say, you know, they would never care. They care a lot and you know, there's art happenings like all the time and they're busy. I mean, you've had, Silan, you've had um, uh, supporters of the gallery pay for a booth in an art fair that didn't happen. Um, but you have support from a kind of community, from people who buy work, people who support things. Is that something you had to really work on growing? Um, yeah, so we were originally meant to have a booth at Art Stage, and uh, that didn't happen. But um, our, our only, uh, uh, well, our our intention to be at Art Stage, like, all we wanted was to show Singapore art. Uh, our gallery deals in exclusively Singapore art and artists. 
and this is because we feel Singapore artists are underrepresented. Even in an art fair that happens in Singapore, you don't see much Singapore art. You know, you go to galleries in Singapore, you don't see Singapore art. But you go to Indonesia, you see Indonesian art. You go to Vietnam, you go to see Vietnamese art. But I think so when, you're, when you're talking about that, you're not really meaning that there's an art form that is recognizably Singaporean, more yeah. artists who happen to be yeah, Singaporean. Yeah, artists who happen to be Singaporean, and, or, or Singapore-based. Um, and, and, and that was the reason why we were, we were doing that. And, uh, but uh, we, we, we have been selling last year. Like every, every show, we've sold work and we've made up half the rent through sales and the other half, uh, I sell my own work and I just pump the money back into the gallery and try to support that. So, uh, and, and just a, like a plug, like, uh, because we didn't do Art Stage, um, in February we're gonna have a show at our gallery called Backstage and you can come and see all the actors who never made it to the front, to the audience. Um, I want to return um, to something Silan mentioned at the beginning about censorship. So um, my father-in-law and I have a game. So um, he's a very old, I mean, old-fashioned leftist. Um, and he always asks me every time I see him to explain what the difference between what I do, editing a magazine is, and what a censor does. Um, we've moved, you know, and every time it's a complete struggle. And I can't really, and he said, you made a choice? And I said, yes. And he said, choices are censoring. Um, and I think it's also interesting that censorship doesn't just happen government down. We were talking earlier that uh, with Art Review, we used to have a lot of problems um, selling magazines in America through Borders because Borders is owned by Mormons, and Mormons um, deemed a lot of what we were doing pornography if there were certain types of nude images. So it can happen in all kinds of ways. And I wonder how you make the choices yourself about which thing to select and which things are not. And surely that's a kind of, not necessarily, I'm sure we wouldn't think of it as censorship, but it's making a choice, is making a choice not to do something as well as to do something. Yeah, my, um, I, I, I think I would definitely say that I'm guilty of it. I have two anecdotes. One, one is that people often come into our space and say, especially tourists, and say, oh, but this stuff doesn't look Burmese. Like, I'm looking for something that looks Burmese. Um, or looks like it's from Myanmar. And what they mean is uh, Buddha's face and monks and pagodas and very beautiful, very talented painters in, in Yangon, no doubt. But um, we don't show that stuff in, in Myanmar. And there's, there is an aspect of maybe censorship, but our reasoning is that um, there's many other galleries in Yangon where you can show this work. So if painters come and ask, well, there's about 40 galleries in Yangon. They almost all show this kind of painting. So we kind of send them to support the other galleries. And then I have one short story about a street artist of mine, very young, ambitious, um, has some paintings right now at Intersections Gallery on Kandahar Street, another plug. Um, he wanted to do an installation critiquing religion and using a Torah, a Bible, and um, a Quran. Now, he's a Muslim artist. He's not practicing. He's an atheist. So for him, it's like this is a no-brainer. And I thought, Bible is probably fine. He wanted to make them into comic books. Um, Torah, I mean, it would be hard. There's a very, there's about three Jews in Yangon, so probably not going to be a problem. But the Quran, he said, I want to borrow my mom, like, I'm going to use my mom's Quran. And I was like, no, you're not. You're not doing that installation. And I basically censored him and said, don't do that. And he, he thought of something else that was really nice. So I, I sometimes have to put my foot down, and I suppose it is censorship, but... Uh, I guess general people would call it politeness. Maybe I was just showing respect to his mother, yes. Um, thinking really, I think, again, different scenarios, different kind of stories, but the one that I can think of, which is probably quite relevant here, is when we were running the magazine, it was called Two Magazine, came out, sporadically, but you know, biannually basically at the end before we closed down. What we found was we were sitting here with the ability to say quite a lot because everyone perceived us to be a lifestyle fashion society magazine. So expecting us to censor everything, we were able to give quite a broad space because no one perceived it to be anything that meant anything. So if you can imagine working with these artists, 
it was like, it was like, you know, giving Abhishad Pong free reign or NK, who had been, who's been blacklisted a gazillion times for her films and they keep getting banned. Um, it was like kind of, it was really interesting to find an alternative language. So knowing that there are other censors without maybe fully realizing it, we were kind of, I guess it was like, you know, taking the opposing role, but not, not realizing it, so to speak. The only thing I censor is boring art, and so <laughs> what is boring? Well, the, the, what, what's not boring to me is something that's conceptually very resolved, aesthetically quite uh, astute, and um, also sincerity is a big part of the, the, you know, what makes an artwork. So if these three things are, are not present in a work or an artist, then um, I, I, I choose not to show it. Uh, but if they're young and, you know, the aesthetics are not there or the concept, or you know, the uh, concepts are not fully like mature, but the sincerity is very much there. I still try to support them because um, people need a platform to kind of grow uh, and to incubate their ideas and develop. Yeah. I mean, there's also something as you know, simple as like for me, the artists that I choose to work with or the projects that I realize are the artists that I like. You know, so the censorship that can happen or the nose that can happen might happen just because you have deferring opinions and it's sometimes as simple as that really yeah. but I think it's an interesting thing to be aware of in a context where we're talking about artistic freedom is that there are limits whether they're taste um, or intellectual proclivities or anything else to how free that can be um, it's the same with a magazine where I might not necessarily want to publish a text about how Brexit's the most amazing thing ever um, but I think one of the other things I mean we are talking about is um, certain ideas of national or local stereotypes, like particularly when you're projecting outside of the country, but also maybe the country projects onto itself. I think increasingly in Southeast Asia, that's a, a thing that's happening. And I wonder if like, what you're doing in a way is about rejecting those kind of assumed or stereotypical positions. Um, yeah, it's been very difficult to navigate Myanmar in the last five years. It went from a very high high to a rock bottom low. Um, and now we're sort of picking up the pieces and as a space that, that must, um, must continue to support regardless, right? We don't, we're not boycotting to make a point. We must have dialogue, we must discuss, um, but we're also not going to force uh, force artists who have, have sort of, maybe they do have some nationalist expressions. I mean, it's hard not to in Myanmar. There's so much symbolism. Um, we don't really discourage that, you know. We, we encourage, you know, being critical, being conceptual, experimenting, but that, that kind of thing is, um, is natural. So I have had responses from people who ask, you know, why would you be in Myanmar? like the genocide and what's happening there like how could you support them but nothing changes if we don't engage and that to me has been the driving force so of course in a way I am I am I have the the benefit of being a foreigner so I am not attached to Myanmar nationalist ideals but um, but I accept that they have them and, um, and that they self-censor as well, and that they have, I just want to be that space where they can work through that. Okay, so I'm from Thailand. I am Thai. I've not spent so much of my life there, but it's what I identify with and have always done, so it's home, right? Thailand has a very distinct idea of itself, as you know, you know, amazing Thailand, land of smiles, gold, temples XYZ and that idea is shifting and in the last 10 years in particular the last three has seen an enormous flux shift we don't really know what's happening but what I know for me is um, the Thailand that that I, I more so identify with as as I get older as I spend more time there is the Thailand pre all of this right there's the land there's kind of what existed before these fabricated notions of what we are as a country. You know, Thai, when, when, when 
So, so we just had a Biennale, it's happening still right now, it's very good. It's defined Thailand to be a certain thing, a certain set of values. So, you know, it, or, or it seems to do that. But once you dig in a little bit closer, and I think this is where the function of contemporary art and kind of experiencing it, coming to Thailand and seeing things, you realize that there are so many layers and part of our identity is this kind of duality, constantly going at each other. And I think that's what we have in common in our region actually, this kind of constant shift and flux. Um, uh, I think in Singapore there's not much of uh, nationalism in that sense. Also because, the, you know, it's a melting pot of different cultures and, you know, sometimes there's no one culture that we all identify with, I think. Um, uh, but in any case, you know, I, I wouldn't support any work that, that pushes for nationalism or xenophobia and its views or even sexism or homophobia, so it looks like I censor a lot, huh? But I know... <laughs> you know, when, so friends in the UK know I'm coming to Singapore, they're always going to talk about hygiene and cuisine, right? It's so clean and the food's so great. Um, so there are these kind of other kind of ideas about Singapore that are projected maybe externally about, you know, obsessive characteristics maybe, eating and cleaning. Um, yeah. It's also peaceful, like a cemetery. <laughs> Um, and the way this talk was introduced, um, um, it was kind of, um, the word alternative spaces, alternative practices comes up. And this seems to me to be a very relative thing. To someone coming along maybe 10 years or 20 years after, or even more recently, um, you're all going to be part of the establishment, whether you like it or not. It's not a choice you make. You've just been there censoring people. Um, <laughs> And someone's going to say, you know, um, hey, screw those guys. We have to set up something different. Is that something you're aware of? And does it become a problem as you grow older as spaces or as practices? I'd really love that. I mean, I, I think the whole idea is, you know, uh, kill your masters. Like, the establishment be damned. You have to, you have to do what you feel is is in the moment, is in the zeitgeist and all of that. And I, I, don't, I don't know if, if we'll be part of the establishment. I hope that we're all remembered as um, you know, people who tried, who did good things and, and worked well with artists. But for sure, the new stuff has to come along. It can't, it's, got, it's got to remain experimental and it has to, has to have that, that onward feeling. You can't really, well, I guess you can try. You can't necessarily erase history, right? So what, what it is that they're going to see 10 years from now, you know, are these images, say. And to say, like, I, I, have, I have trouble with, that, like, grasping that idea sometimes, you know, always being on the other side, like, fighting for this. This is what should be, you know, all of that, you know, whatever. But one day, maybe that is then the accepted norm, then what do you do? I guess in your case, you're probably going to get a situation where someone will say, like, I love that video project you did. Can you do one exactly the same, but different? Um. Yeah, and then probably it would be like, yes, no, maybe it depends, right? Because <laughs> it, it's really hard to say until you actually get there. But I know that I have that idea of like, being part of that bigger thing I don't, I don't know. It's not, not, maybe not there yet to be able to say. Yeah, I think maybe one commonality I'm, I'm seeing between us is that we're filling a gap. Like, we wouldn't be doing the things we, we do if someone else was already doing it. So if we move on, we grow, or we evolve into something else, uh, I'm sure there's still going to be a gap. And I'm sure with the kind of uh, foundation, I hope, that we lay, uh, the next generation of artists and curators will, will, you know, will carry on the good work. I mean, I think also it's important maybe to make clear that what you're doing isn't necessarily antagonistic. So you will sell work. It's not you're against selling it. It's not that you're against artists being successful. It's not that you're against artists being popular. And because I think that's always the assumption when you talk about alternative spaces, like you know, popularity, a crime. Um, and I think maybe that's important to talk about a little bit that that you're okay with being successful, right? 
Yeah, I mean, we are popular, you know. <laughs> it's like our openings have, uh, our, our last opening had like 120, 130 people, you know, in a small space. And, uh, you know, the, the whole place was packed. Um, and then we do sell some works. And that's okay. I mean, as long as the, the ideas get out and the artists. And that's why we continue doing what we're doing. We want uh, to champion Singapore artists and, and we want their work to be seen, right? These labels are a bit problematic. There's always people that want to ask you, like, well, are you for profit or non profit? And um, it doesn't it doesn't work like that. You I mean, these kinds of spaces have to be a mixed model because there isn't an establishment um, in existence. So I mean, I, I don't know who would refuse to sell an artist's work on principle. That seems ridiculous when the artist already makes so little. Um, and of course, we wish, you know, uh, it would be great to be able to become, an es become part of the establishment, maybe, um, based on the principles that we embody now. Yeah. Um, I think what we plan to do in the interest of non-censoring things is also to say that if anyone wants to ask a question spontaneously, um, feel free to do so. It's not a closed discussion between us. It's a, a question that I would like to address to all of the panelists or the speakers. Uh, you've presented three different countries, three different unique situations, and I would like to know from a spontaneous uh, place that you are at the moment, or you might project yourself into it, um, where would you, which seat would you like to occupy? The Myanmar or Myanmar seat? The Thai seat or the Singapore seat? Would you change situations with any one of your co-speakers and which one would it be? And if you could explain the change. We're happy for each other. No, because um, I mean, I, I couldn't be these two. Like, and I think um, we've all, uh, like, I think we'd like to work together. Yeah, I agree. I second that. Like, we've yeah. met a couple of times now together, and we're realizing more and more how, how nicely it all works out. So, to connect the countries, maybe instead of becoming each other, we just, like, we just come all together and create something new, I think that would be more relevant for us, no? Uh, you know, having a C focus, sort of. <laughs> I mean, I think, I mean, one of the things you've all been quite articulate about saying is whatever you do is a response to the context, and it's not something necessary that would be transportable in that sense, right? Because it's born out of specific circumstances and to some degree, specific cultures. Because I think in the art world, and particularly in art fair, there is this idea that everything is movable, portable, can be dropped anywhere in any context, but precisely what you guys do is work in reaction to specific contexts. So perhaps for that reason, it's quite hard to imagine taking over a shift in the graveyard for Sealand. <laughs> I know, I'm very used to graveyards because my grandfather was a grave digger in Lim Chukang Cemetery. So that's why I used that expression. Exactly, you'd like to describe yourself as a pariah. I'm the pariah of Singapore art scene. I make pariah art. <laughs> um, I wonder, like, we've kind of briefly touched on how you sustain what you do, but I wonder if you'd be able to say, like, how much time you have to spend fundraising or making what you do viable as opposed to sort of actually doing it. Because the glamorous idea is you're just out there doing shows, doing projects, but Behind that, you must have to do quite a lot of um, uh, fundraising and infrastructure work. I'd say the prep work, the proposals that are rejected, the pitches, the meetings, the time that's invested to actually make something happen is, I'd say it's 70%, no, 70, 80%. But you know, this is where I think 
having maybe a legal background has <laughs> been really useful because it's really like a lot of it is trying to conv convince someone who might not know, not only to, kn to, uh, to know, but to understand and to adapt adopt what it is that you're doing, you know? And that takes time and commitment, and I think the only way to make it sustainable, it's gonna sound really odd, but it's something that like you just have to keep doing. And it, it doesn't get easier every time, it's a little bit different, but you know, it, then more challenges come. But I think, you know, in the 15 odd years or something I've been doing this, it's sort of, I found that the family grows, right? So you kind of meet people who you didn't know just like last year and they might be able to help you somehow and I think it's this very collaborative thing and the only thing that makes it vaguely possible are the collaborations. Yeah. I, I think uh, you know it's very much like running a business actually uh, whether or not you're driven by profit because you know if, if, you, if you start a new business you got to prepare for the first year to make losses and then only in the second year you might see you know, kind of breaking even or moving forward, and that's what I've observed. Yeah, and I'm, I mean, we have a really mixed model. We rent the space out to organizations in Yangon who want, like, a cool space surrounded by art for a meeting. We can charge, like, $150 a day. And that, you know, that's on my way to paying the rent. Um, we, I, I, I take cultural project management jobs, and my salary goes into... Um, goes into the space. Sometimes we sell the work and we split it with the artist. Um, and for me personally, to be honest, I have a partner that has a salary job who believes in what I do. And I would never have been able to open a space without that kind of security where he's very um, not happy about it necessarily, but, but spending his salary on making this art space run. <laughs> um, so, uh, so yeah, as, as Shamwan said, it's, it's all about collaboration. If you don't have people around you that believe in what you're doing, it's never going to work. And that is already an experiment, right? You have to open and you have to start and you have to keep going to meet those people who believe in what you do and will support you. Yeah, like last year I did this group exhibition and I had a big piece and I sold it. And people were like, congrats, you know, you sold the work. I was like, uh, I don't know, because I took all the money and just paid the rent that month. <laughs> you know, so the shows could carry on. Uh, and also last year, I did everything myself, from from preparing the food to cleaning to interviewing the artists to printing the catalogs, you know, to selling the work to delivering the work, every single thing. And and I didn't ask for help, and maybe that's a mistake, uh, but uh, I didn't want to burden anyone else. But somehow through these continued actions, uh, right now I have a team of five who just came forward and volunteered out of their own goodwill. So. And that's that's important too, isn't it, to ask for help? That's also taken me a long time. Um, that once you do start asking uh, and you're really forthcoming about this is how I'm funding or not funding something, um, people just come out for you and that's, that's really useful. Um, so the idea is you can just keep popping up hands. So um, I had a question about uh, all of your spaces are so based on local, um, uh, local politics, local artists, um, which necessarily uh, become as multi multidisciplinary moves into craft, you know, versus conceptual, hard contemporary art. And it's ironic, I think, because uh, a lot of the big contemporary kind of blockbuster art world of like Art Basel Miami Beach or something like that it seems to be relatively safe from so the sort of censorship that maybe the local spaces are dealing with. Um, uh, because it's so invested in um, money um, uh, that you guys are all working to have, but then perhaps, I guess the question I have is if you had, if, you th if your, the work that you were doing was housed in an ivory uh, gallery that had the aesthetic of looking like it was part of what you would say a traditional Western model of um, art gallery, do you think censorship would be less? If you were doing the exact same thing, but you put it in an aesthetic that was basically like, like if you put something in Art Basel Miami Beach, if you did one of the works that you might produ uh, produce in um, Singapore, you probably wouldn't face a great deal of censorship for that over 
there, not simply just because of a national issue, but also just because it's just not as recognizable within a trajectory of art that is always supposed to be kind of uh, pushing the boundaries and um, is almost tapped out um, against pushing the boundaries in capital, I guess you would say. But you pay to be in that fair. Right. A huge amount of money. Oh, you, uh, but what I'm saying, not, not as literally, more that like just you think in the aesthetic. But I'm saying that is censorship. Right. That is censorship. That exclusivity is prohibitive. And if you think that any of us could show up with like the things that we do in Bangkok and Singapore and Myanmar in Miami Beach without being judged, which is also a type of censorship, I mean, it's never, it would never happen. You have to sanitize. When Myanmar artists show abroad, it's like, in their own context, it all makes sense. And then you put them in a white cube and everyone's like, oh, it's so dirty. It's so amateur. Right. It's so derivative. Right. So like well, taking out of context, of course, there's, and art fairs have a very specific mode. That money is prohibitive too. And it's, I know it seems obvious. I know that's, you're, but you're basically trying to ask, you're trying to get around it and there's no getting around it. Right. I think. Right. What, what I'm saying is more is, does the aesthetics um, create less censorship? Like if, does the, does, does the cube uh, lessen censorship? The artists that I've worked with over the years have all had at some point their works in these fairs. And I know in the case of Apishat Pong in particular, you know, his latest film w could, was, no, he chose not to show it in Thailand for various reasons. It, it was a choice. The works that you see, the photographs that you see, could, could, I mean, they could be shown in Thailand, but they wouldn't. You know what I mean? In a way, I understand what you're saying. Is that cube um, an, a veil almost? Yeah, and that's what I'm saying. Can it be useful? I, I think yes. I mean, if they're already there, you know? Like, Symmetry of Splendor came out in 2016. As Two Magazine, we published this visual diary like at the same time. We knew that he wasn't going to show this film in Thailand. You know, I think there was an art fair a few months later, and they showed a whole series of work which was based on these ideas that he was exploring in the film, which never would have made it through the senses in Thailand. And the work is very beautiful, right? So the aesthetics kind of fit, and I think, you know, again, but it, it, it depends on people understanding the context. You know, to one person, it might just be a beautiful print by Apishat Pong. To another, they know exactly what he's trying to say, and I mean, you know, some of the work that our other artist friends have had in the fairs, if you know what they're talking about, if you're Thai and you see that, like, 8 p.m. whatever uh, public announcement thing that they have on the TV and they every single channel has it. You know exactly what they're talking about, but they can show that here. I don't know if that ex that would happen in and Thailand to begin with. And it's not just about the fair or the white cube or big gallery. It's you know it's about the the it's country specific, right? Or it's location specific. Like uh, any artwork that is controversial in Singapore, you can show it anywhere in the world because they they won't really understand. Right. what the artist is trying to say. You could show it in an independent space that looks even more roughed up than mine, and uh, no, one's gonna, no one's gonna bother. It's, it's, the veil is not the setting, it's not the white cube, it's not the fair. Uh, it's, it's the context, the localized context. Yeah. Um, I think it's also worth saying that Sealand space is a kind of white cube, and it's very, very much looks like a gallery too. But maybe it's also a question about audiences as much as it is of the aesthetics of a space. It's also what audience are looking for, what kind of state of mind they're going to be in, how deep they're going to look um, as well. Uh, just to follow up on that, like last year, uh, I didn't do a lot of renovations on my space, but this year I did consciously make it look more commercial because uh, I wanted to show Singapore art and, 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 and be independent, but you know, have like a very nice, clean aesthetic, almost like a white cube. I guess the follow-up then to the question that was just asked is, had the new aesthetics of your gallery improved sales? Is it well, too early to tell? Yeah, it's we just moved in January and we just had our first show. We have sold one or two paintings, but please come by and buy some more then, you know. <laughs> Are there more questions from this one over here? Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, just want to go back to the word fostering. Um, are, you, are you fostering more people like you 
in your respective cities? Are you, are you um, kind of mentoring or helping others to find gaps in other places? I mean, surely in every city we could do with more than one of you. Um, you, you do kind of make it sound really fun, adventurous. You look good sitting up there. There's a glam factor that is kind of up there. But I'm just wondering, you know, for, for people sitting in the audience and listening to you, because, well, yeah, I just want to be just like him or her. And how do I do this? How do I, I mean, there must be people in your orbit that, that want to do this. So are you fostering that? Yeah, I, I love it when people come and, and ask, like, how do I... You know, how, how do I open a space or how do I manage a project? How do I start this? How can I get involved? Um, and sometimes they're just asking, like, they just want to do their own thing. And, and it's great. It's, um, I'm always, always giving advice. Um, and maybe it's to artist curators. Maybe it's just to students who are interested in art. Maybe it's to collectors who don't know where to start and they, they just want to know more. I think, I mean, being open about that and not being intimidated by competition is so key um, and really important. You mean like, do I advertise my mentoring? Uh, is that what you mean? Um, no, they come, I mean, I have a space, so they come to me. We have, we have not only art exhibitions, we have music, we have talks, we have, so um, I meet them through the space, um, yeah. Um, Instagram, so Instagram and interns. I, they kind of find you, you find them. It's really odd, but some of the projects that I've done, people will contact me through Instagram and be like, are you working on anything, can we help you? And I'm always so surprised. And I'm like, you know, you know, you're not really gonna maybe get paid. We don't have any money. But they're like, it's okay. We want to try it. And it's really interesting how, you know, it it you sort of find each other, right? And then I, I I love having, kind of, gosh, now I sound now I feel really old, but like kind of young people, <laughs> around. And they. There's ones, you know, and, and everyone kind of finds their own voice and their own specific method. Like working on Ghosts with Crit, we had so many volunteers. A l really big part of the ghost programming is, you know, the curators basically, this, this whole storytellers thing. For me, I basically existed on a team of like volunteers who really wanted to know how to throw an art dinner. You know, they really wanted to understand how to put together a guest list, how to fundraise. And they kind of found me and it was really great. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I actually really, really hope that uh, people will actually take the torch and, and do something else based on some of the things that they've observed or learned. You know, it's like, and this is personal, uh, personal investment because my own practice uh, suffers from me organizing the space. Last year, I only made one work and luckily it sold. But yeah, uh, all the time I'm investing in the space, you know, has an effect. Um, and I think people curating their own shows is really healthy in my space and I hope more of that happens. Uh, some of the lessons are, are even just practical, like they don't know how to drill and mount paintings onto the wall, so we try to pass on that knowledge, so it's, it is happening organically. I think also, I mean, maybe it's interesting you to talk a little bit because your space is also based on other spaces that are older that you encountered or showed at, so in some ways you've benefited from what you've experienced from previous models. It's not that it's just a magic mushroom that popped yeah. up in the middle of the yeah. forest. Yeah, definitely, like 10 years ago, or t 10 or 12 years ago, I did my first solo exhibition at Your Mother Gallery. And, uh, you know, without that show and doing that independently, it's an artist run space with Jeremy here. Without that show, I wouldn't be running my own space today because I learned so much from that process and observing the shows there. Maybe in another five years, there'll be somebody else. Yeah, and I was also that person. I, I was studying in Singapore and we had a very like practice based master's program and we had. Um, independent curators who were mostly women traveling around Southeast Asia, you know, Isabel Ching, Eva McGovern, um, Aaron Gleason, like these really cool, you know, appeared glam when they were lecturing in our class. Um, and, and they kind of, they were so accessible that they kind of made me think, like, I can do that. You know, I can, um, and, and then talking to them and asking them for advice uh, was, was also, yeah, so you try to pass that on a bit, for sure. 
Um, we've probably got time for one more question or two if the first one's quick. Does anyone else? If not, then maybe to kind of wrap things up and in the spirit of the previous question from the audience, is there one piece of advice you'd give to someone looking to be your acolyte or um, looking to follow along the same path? Silan's writing it down. <laughs> okay, if you want to do this, be prepared to lose money, all right? And then ask yourself, if I'm going to lose money and I'm still going to do it, then what is the driving force or the rationale? What is, what is the spirit behind doing this? Uh, find your reason. I guess for me, it's like uh, maybe don't take no for an answer because there's always a way to, to do what you want to do. It might not take the shape or form that you first imagined, but I think having room to be pragmatic, but understanding from the very start what it is. And it's not necessarily, the form might change, right? But knowing what it is that you want to communicate and knowing that there's other resources and that, you know, ultimately I don't think we're totally alone, you know, in, in kind of doing things. I was just about to say, find supporters. Um, whether it's your family members or your artists, I mean, make sure it's a mix, right? Artists, curators, people already working in the professional world, gallerists, collectors, I mean, these are your, these are your fans and you need to foster that too and, and ask for help, yeah. Um, I'm afraid that's um, where we've run out of time, but I'd like to thank you all for coming on a Saturday afternoon and also in particular to thank um, all three of the speakers for sharing with us. Thank you.